Hello everyone, it's been a while, and welcome to our first ever disclaimer. This episode was originally recorded in January, but since the podcast has been on a break for various personal reasons, you're only getting this one now. This is the last episode of the previous batch, but we'll be back soon with all new episodes. Also, content warning for this episode, as we'll be briefly talking about sexual assault, around the 13 to 14 minute mark and at about the one hour mark. But now, on with the episode. Welcome to the Anime Research Group, a show about the weird and wonderful mistake that is anime. I'm Ian. I'm Denny. I'm Freya. And this week, in our quest to watch all the shows we never have time for, we look at Die Buster, where I didn't read what Denny had wrote for me to read out. <laughs> where Denny made a Steven Universe reference. Yes. Where we just want to see a giant woman. But before we get on to talking about giant women, it's been a long time since we recorded a podcast. So I assume we've all been watching anime and stuff in that time. I actually have been. I watched a whole show, which you probably never heard of called Ride Back, which was about a ballerina that injured herself and then picked up robot sports racing, where she rides a bipedal robot with wheels that can transform into a bike as well. It was kind of nice at the, during the first half, but then in the second half, it turned all about terrorism and fighting back against the fascist regime. And I think I would have preferred it to just be a racing show. I, I feel like this was like a thing that was very common in like idol shows where idols were in mix is like they have to fight against the oppressive regime like AKB was all about that. Other than that I finally got around to starting to watch uh, Code Geass. I've watched the first 15 episodes of that which I enjoyed quite a lot. I was surprised when I started watching it how human Lelouch was from all the memes and like the knowledge about him I absorbed from osmosis. I always thought he was a much more calm and calculating character but no basically all of his plans seem to fail in some manner, and things just keep going wrong for him. I'm struggling to like recall just how much of a calculating asshole he becomes, but definitely in the beginning, while he's trying to figure everything out, he's just making so many mistakes, and it's uh, quite enjoyable. I mean, it is quite easy to get screwed over when your enemy just gets uh, a level 100 god mech that can do no wrong uh, for no reason at all, except that his brainwaves are compatible, whatever that means. Yeah, fucking Spinzaku. Hmm. How about you, Ian? Well, when I wrote down the notes about what I was watching at the time, I was watching a lot of Western animation. Uh, like, I watched the third season, I guess we call it, of Disenchantment. That was bad, but <laughs> mo- mostly because they couldn't make up their mind if they wanted to have, like, a long arc or just do weird hijinks on a uh, week-by-week basis. And so they did both, with <laughs> causing damage to both parts. But we're getting Richard Ayoade in this, which is always good. Other than that, I've mostly been watching like really old OVAs, like Bari Bari Densetsu, which I recommend. That's a motorbike racing OVA. Five Star Stories, which I don't recommend, but I might want read the manga one day. How about you, Freya? I watch Star Trek. That's an anime, right? Yeah. I think he has animated shows, so yes. I also watch Skelter Heaven. Oh yes, we did watch Skelter Heaven, that's right. Skelter Heaven deserves its place at the bottom of Miles' ranking. Well, actually, no, it's not the bottom. I believe um, uh, Mars of Destruction is still yeah. the bottom. But Mars of Destruction is amazing and should not be at the bottom. Both made by the same people. Yeah, which, which surprised us. And honestly, me and Freya, no, we've kept up with, with uh, watching EX Arm, and EX Arm is way funnier than Skelter Heaven. Hmm... <laughs> I mean, Fred, it's, uh, you can't deny that we're laughing out loud like at least five or six times per episode of EX Arm. Uh, and the fact that that hasn't stopped after five episodes is frankly somewhat amazing. Uh, it's such a joy to watch. I have to confess that I just find it sad. <laughs> well, uh, I both watching EX Arm and Scale to Heaven, I do get kind of sad sometimes. <laughs> But, like, this has been a good season. I've been, like, keeping up with some anime. I think I'm, like, a week behind on things like Wonder Egg and stuff. But I'm mostly keeping up. How are you, how much are you loving the Skate Matador of Love, Ian? Because we very much enjoy them. Oh, I feel I have mixed opinions on that guy, but he can be quite funny, yes. I mean, that anime is everything I wanted from a skateboarding anime. Which was to, which was to, which was to say I didn't want it to resent skating too much. <laughs> So we, Ian, how is skating uphill? <laughs> Difficult. Yes. 
Especially when you do a high speed reverse. Spoilers, I guess. Spoilers. I will say that um, the skating is like it's really it's really well animated, mm-hmm. but it's like just stupid enough that I don't care that it's unrealistic. <laughs> like they keep doing freestyle tricks in the middle of a downhill race. It's like that's <laughs> not true. Although they keep calling it a rail slide, whereas if it was a rail slide, they they would definitely bail. If they're doing a gorilla wheelie, which looks very similar to the untrained eye. <laughs> yeah, I'm a skateboarding nerd. I saw uh, I saw a blind a blind skateboarder today. That was cool. But I guess we have to stop talking about how great skate is and start talking about Die Buster. Die Buster! Die Buster! Also known as Gumbuster Part Two. Now with more fully Cooly. So much more fully Cooly. The anime ran from November 2004 until August 2006 for a total of six episodes. It was, of course, made by Studio Gainax and, as mentioned last time, served as their 20th anniversary special, which is why it's full of references to not just Gunbuster, but other Gainax shows as well, though we won't be going too much in detail on that. It's a sequel to 1998's Gunbuster, of course, with, as we mentioned last time, another possible sequel planned, though no details have been confirmed. While the show does take place in the same universe and has a lot of direct connections to Gunbuster, it's more of a spiritual successor, I'd say. In the same manner that it serves as a spiritual successor to Gunbuster, its last two episodes essentially serve as a spiritual predecessor to Gurren Lagann, which took the scale that was attempted here and moved it to a whole new level. I don't really have too much to say about um, the production history because we covered a lot of that in last week's episode on Gunbuster, so let's just get straight into the episode summaries. So yeah, before we start talking about the co- the, the, the gig of the episode summary, it's um, content warning. So much rampant hypersexualization. <laughs> That's mostly it. I mean, the, the violence is cartoon violence. I think it's mostly within reasonable bounds. Uh, also, we're going to alternate these, ep- these uh, episode descriptions because I don't want to say six episodes in a row. <laughs> so in the first episode, we get introduced to Nona, who is running away from home to become a space pilot. She ends up working at a cafe where she is rescued from some mech-induced sexual harassment by Lalk Melk Mal. That's the only time I'm going to say her full name. A quote-unquote topless and an an honest-to-goodness space pilot. So as Lalk leaves, Nono chases after her. She's desperate to become become a pilot like her. But Lalk says that she can't become one no matter how hard she works because only topless can fight in these, uh, well, the buster machines that we're going to see soon. So after the conversation, Nono ends up getting put in some danger by a space monster, and Lalk has to come and rescue her again. And she does so by summoning her buster machine, the Snoof. Um, so Lalk tells Nono to leave, but Nono just has to try and stay and save her boss, who also got put in danger by this monster. And this causes her to activate her own topless powers. The monster flies into space with Nono, Lalk gives chase, and Lalk tries to attack the monster, but her robot Dysnuf hesitates to do so uh, because Nono is still alive and on top of the space monster. The monster gets finished off when Nono performs an Inazuma kick. Shout out to Gunbuster. Uh, and Lalk uses a Buster Beam. And so we end that episode on a celebration because Nono has realized that she can become a pilot because she has the right powers now. All right, moving on to episode two Don't Call Me Big Sis. Or Nechan, if you want to be a weeb. Episode 2 introduces Nono to the other Buster pilots. She says that she is a robot, that she doesn't know where she comes from, and that her plan is to become a space pilot like Lalk. Needless to say, the others are skeptical. Lalk has to leave to go to a ship in orbit where uh, the captain, Hattori, has been investigating into the topless, saying he believes they are the same as the aliens and should be abolished. Nicola, piece of shit, another of the pilots, tells Nono that she should go to see Dysnuf and try going inside and talking with it. When she's inside it, the sirens go off, announcing the space monsters. The ships go to engage the monsters, but are ineffective, thus confirming the idea that only the topless can defeat them. Lalk summons Dysnuf so she can join the fight, effectively teleporting it, with Nono, inside Hattori's ship. She is forced to fight, darling in the Frank style with no no behind her. Oh dear! It's 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 accurate within the. I'm, I'm, within, I'm, going, to, within, I'm going to excise it. 
She is forced to fight with Nono sitting behind her, not Darling in the Frank style. She plans to join with the pilot Nicola in a two in a two mech maneuver. However, Nono sees a ship falling to Mars and convinces Lauk to save it instead. At the end of the episode, Nono is wearing an official trainee uniform and says she will work hard with guts, etc., etc. Shout out, Gunbuster. <laughs> Episode 3 is called I Hate Topless, and it's essentially the Tycho episode, Tycho being our equivalent to Jung Freud in this show. She is another one of the topless pilots who is very obsessed with her score uh, and competing with Lalk, who is like the best scorer in the entire topless. Uh, but at the beginning of this episode, her Tycho's buster machine gets thrashed and is irreparable. There is another machine that's uh, ready to be deployed, but it isn't clear if Nono or Tycho will be the pilot. So during a mission where they're setting up a minefield, Tycho challenges Nono to a duel to see who is worthier. There is also a subplot set in the giant space station where we learn about Tycho's uh, childhood trauma, namely that her brother died of space radiation sickness, the same thing that killed the coach in Gunbuster, and she blames herself for not saving him, blaming her on topless powers as such. Uh, we also have a, sub, a minor subplot with some orphans who want to see snow and think the stars are snow that they see through a window because windows on space stations are always such fantastic ideas. When the aliens arrive, both Nono and Tycho uh, go to board the new mech and there is a confrontation be between the two of them with Nono saying that a buster machine would never awaken to a pilot uh, that doesn't believe in themselves and only cares about their score, which causes Tycho to have a realization and makes her decide to fight for herself rather than the score. So Nono lets her board the mech, and she protects the, resi uh, the residential part of the city from the incoming aliens, essentially destroying an entire fleet by herself with her new mech uh, and ice beam powers. Episode 4 is Resurrection, the legendary buster machine. I think it's the most confusing of the episodes, but <laughs> it's mostly about Nono's desire to pilot a buster machine and to finally prove herself. So there's an excavation on Titan to try and awaken its gravity well, which are like these aliens, uh, in the hopes of gaining access to an ancient buster machine. So obviously Nono tries to visit the site to learn if this is true and maybe see if she can get in on the uh, buster machine for herself. But Nina, Nina, the alarms go off and she gets brought before the Serpentine sisters, who are a set of ancient topless. Uh, they tell her that a buster machine is too heavy of a burden for her. But there is one on Pluto that you could go and try and get. They're doing this to keep her out of the way, uh, essentially. So the gravity well gets opened, and it is revealed to be a topless, but it refuses to be controlled, and it starts lashing out. It kills many of the pilots and a lot of space monsters that have been surrounding it. At this point, Nono is on Pluto, and she's been picked up by Cassio, who is like one of the team, who gives her a lift to the crater with the buster machine. And then, through the void, <laughs> hand wave space magic, uh, she can hear Lauk crying out, and this causes her to transform into a buster machine herself and warp all the way back to Titan, uh, just like we've seen uh, D Sniff and stuff do. She starts controlling the various monsters and uses them to attack the gravity well. We got a speech about believing in yourself. Uh, and then finally, she slices through the gravity well with a buster beam and destroys Titan by splitting it into two halves. It's mm -hmm. really cool. <laughs> yeah. Really high, probably, probably the hypest moment in the show. Yeah. After the incident in episode four, the world has started to turn its back on the topless. It seems Captain Hattori's suspicions were correct. Tycho and Lalk are in hospital for this quote-unquote horrific disease. The fraternity is being disbanded, and there is a plan to enter a treaty with the aliens. When Lalk goes to visit Nono, uh, she sees Nicola attempting to force himself on her, and um, if she's in a very bad mental state, she ends up rejecting Nono. Also, Nicola gets quote-unquote arrested. Later, Nono and Lalk are with the fleet heading to the space monster Nest Hole near the black hole Excelio. I wonder what that could be. The space monsters move aside as if obeying Nono. As Nono starts to seal up the gravity well, the largest space monster we've ever seen breaks out, destroying most of the fleet. As the flagship breaks apart, Nono goes to see Lalk and frees her from the restraints on her topless powers. 
Lalk summons Desnerf and throws the planet Jupiter 2 at the monster. However, even this isn't enough to defeat it. Oh, you thought they forgot about Jupiter 2. The only way to win is to turn Jupiter 2 into a plane. <laughs> the only way to win is to turn Jupiter 2 into a black hole. That's a s- half a sentence. Um, but Nona rejects this plan and flies off and the monster enters the warp. It's an entirely accurate sentence. <laughs> it was just funny to read. A clarifier I want to make in case you haven't watched the anime, but then why are you listening to this if you haven't? Um, just the fact that when we talk about space aliens, there's two different kinds of space alien, uh, space monsters. There's the space monsters that the topless fight threat most of the show, and then there's the one that gets released at the end of episode four, which is yeah. the which are the actual original aliens from uh, Gumbuster. The other space monsters are called the Busto Legions, and Nono is controlling them. And they were just closing off the, the, the solar system to prevent humans from going beyond it. Look, we're, well, not, saying it, we're not saying it makes sense. <laughs> I mean, it, it makes sense. In its own twisted way. Anyway, please continue. Yes. Episode 6, The Story of Your Life. In the final episode, the Earth and Moon are being evacuated, and the new giant weapon, the Doos Mill, is being created to fight the aliens in the absence of Nono, who disappeared at the end of episode five, uh, 6. The Deuce Mill is essentially a giant ring around the Earth, and the Imperial uh, Council of Earth has entrusted Lalk with the mission to ram the entire planet into the space mo- into the final space monster. We're going to 1960s Doctor Who, baby. <laughs> like they already tried this once and it didn't work, but they think it's <laughs> going to work the second. Part of the first half of the episode is dedicated to Lalk dealing with her emotional trauma and uh, having flashbacks to Nono. But as the mission gets uh, underway, Nono returns in her combined Diebuster form where to prevent the Earth from being destroyed. This is where we finally get to see the giant woman because her combined form is essentially all of the previous space monsters for- fused together into a giant Nono, and she's the size of the planet. Locke then... Uh, fights Nono with the Diz nerf, crying about how she will save humanity, even if it means losing the Earth. But at the very critical moment, something that has been threatening to happen the entire show, Lalk loses the topless powers and Nono stops the Earth. Nono then turns to fight the gravity well with an ultra in a Zuma kick, but even that doesn't seem to work. But when Lalk realizes that Nono needs her help, she determines to continue fighting and she climbs into Disneuf's real uh, cockpit, which is hidden in his brain and was blocked off by a thorn that's, that was in his right eye for the entire show, which he now rips out. In there, she also removes her clothes and changes into a gumbuster uniform, which she finds in there. But of course, she immediately has to chest rip uh, part of the uniform off in order to get another gumbuster reference in there. This nerf then transforms into its true form and grabs and monsters the Genesee generator, putting it in his, in his chest. We then get a final speech about hard work and guts, and the Lark and Nono team up to perform a double Inazuma kick, finally destroying the gravity well once and for all, but also causing a second big bang, which is thankfully prevented by Nono by turning into some giant cosmic being with hands, with, with giant hands that block the big bang from happening. I'll have more to say on this in a minute. Yes, Nono and Lalk have their emotional goodbye while floating naked in space in, in, inside of those hands, as you do. It's just good manners. And then Nono disappears forever. Ten years later, Lalk is all grown up, and it's the night when Noriko and Kazumi return, and Planet Earth lights up to welcome them, as Lalk vows to tell Nor- uh, Noriko about Nono, who always saw her as her heroine and inspiration. So yeah, if, if, this, if these summaries were a bit confusing, that's because it's been like a month or so since we've seen these episodes. But we'll, we'll talk more about the actual important stuff uh, now. Also, also unlike uh, Gunbuster, where every, pl- every episode had like the most straightforward plot they could manage, they really tried to cram in way more than I thought was as particularly necessary. Like, I, I think I feel like it took like twice as long to say these uh, summaries as it did for Gunbuster. Although... Mm-hmm. Maybe that's just because it's been so long since we did the summaries for that. I don't remember how long that took. Okay, so let's start off by discussing uh, some of these characters. And I guess we should probably start with uh, Nono. What do we think of Nono? To begin the comparisons immediately, like an asshole. Um, (laughs) Whereas Gumbuster is sort of, an, in terms of its protagonist, an Edward-facing show. 
as in all of the other characters mostly only matter in how they relate to um, Noriko. Well, A, Lauk feels much more of an equal protagonist than Kazumi ever did. Mm -hmm. But um, Nono is also more of a, like, outward-facing character in that it's how um, her effects on other people. Right, and she's she's also got, like, much more of, like, a bubbly personality, whereas, like, Noriko was very much, like, feeling inadequate, whereas I don't think Nono has ever felt inadequate in her life. I mean, the, this anime in general has much more of a filled out cast. Like, we don't just have Jung Freud and the coach who don't really, who are just there to drive the others forward here. We've got actual other characters with their own plotline. Whether that's to the detriment or to the advantage of the anime, we'll talk about in a bit. Yeah. But I, I actually don't hate Nono as a character. In a certain way, this very cheerful and bubbly characters can get annoying. But I, I found her to be just the right amount of endearing and slightly grating that i uh, really didn't <laughs> like her that much <laughs> just the right amount of slightly grating then you see this is why i don't watch like barakamon or anything is like i don't think there is a right amount of slightly grating <laughs> <laughs> i don't like nana uh, in fact i don't like almost any of the characters in this with the exception of tiko who we'll come on to later like, what, what do I want to say about Nono? First of all, like, although, like, we know, like, from the beginning that she is a robot, although we don't know that she will become a buster machine, like, we know very little about her. She is a, bl a blank slate. But she seems very obsessed with Noriko, who she insists on referring to as Nono Riri, I guess, carrying on the theme of people forgetting all about <laughs> Noriko uh, and Kazumi which is why, like, the language is backwards in the ending and stuff. Maybe it's just because, like, she's got quote-unquote amnesia, but it's like a lot of, it's like, well, why do you want to become a pilot? It's like, I want to become, like, Nono Riri. How do you know about Nono Riri? Never talked about. Like, presumably, they're reasonably famous. I mean, they, 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 were, they were planning to, like, light up civilization for them. I mean, even besides that, since she's a buster machine, I assume she just has the information somewhere in her backup hard drives and it just got damaged when she was frozen in that meteor, right? Also, uh, Welk is similarly inspired by Nono Rear. So it's probably a society-wide hero worship thing. Mm -hmm. which, is, which is a lot of shade on Kazumi, just to be clear. Like, she was... Well, yeah. She was half of the team that saved the, the world. Like, and yet, like, no one mentions her. I mean, we get to see her light coming down at the end, along with uh, uh, Noriko's, but... Yeah, but that's what happens. History gets uh, warped uh, 10,000 years later. I feel like it's kind of the point that um, they forgot about that the important part of that was the relationship between uh, the two of them being what was successful in the end, uh, mm -hmm. instead of just one person. But there are two things that I really think bother me. One is just how much of an idiot she is. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. Like, I'm okay with a certain amount of klutz, but, like, not to, like, victim blame, but she's almost, like, something complicit in her sexualization in this show. And, I mean, it's not her fault that the show's designers decided to call the topless the topless. Uh, and from here on out, I think I'm only going to refer to them as new types, because I think I've already said topless enough times. But she's just like, oh, topless? Rip. <laughs> Can I fight against the aliens now, Lauk? No, no, no. And that just will never do it for me. I, I'm I'm not 15 years old anymore. You can't. I can't. I can't stand that. But the thing that really bothers me more than that is that her character is like normally all about hard work and guts and the power of friendship. Blah 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 blah. You know the kind of character. Um, Noriko was this kind of character, but unlike Noriko, well, I mean, I mean, I, I talked about this last, uh, episode, in the last episode about how Noriko, although she does do a lot of training and she gets involved in this hard work, at least a little bit, I have to believe that like her success comes down to the fact that she's always using overpowered super weapons. This is just true and more so of Nono because she is an overpowered super weapon. She spends a lot of time giving speeches about hardworking guts, but we only really see her train once, and she mostly spends her time trying to get access to a to a buster machine and cleaning. 
But that really makes sense within the context of the show, because as Freya said, it's it's not about how Nono is impacted by these other people and she gets inspired to work hard. It's about how she inspires to uh, the other people. It's, it's really about her inspiring love. Yes, there is a certain amount of hypocrisy that is created by that in the fact that we never see her really uh, excise the values she preaches about. Well, I don't agree there. Okay. She's, she does do a lot of hard work in the first few episodes. It's, none of it is training specifically to be a mech pilot, but it's hard work. And she's doing the hard work, to be honest, of breaking through the topless's personality flaws in order to inspire them. I think episode three is a good demonstration of that. I guess that's, I guess that, yeah, that's actually a very good point. Otherwise, I think, uh, well, you already said that Noriko's training kind of didn't really matter in the end without really being a detriment to the theme of the show. That's because, but that's at least in part because the implication was that during her time, we always hear about how she is training, even if we're not seeing it uh, on screen. And like in the whole first episode of Gunbuster is just about how like with the hard work, she will manage to live up to the, to the standards that people have like imposed upon her. That's just, and like, that's just not true of Nono. And the reason I, that this annoys me is not because I don't see partially see your point it's that i feel that the point of gunbuster was about at least in part about like working hard and living up to be living up to be the thing that you're trying to be whereas i feel like this show only does lip service to it is that what gunbuster's about well that and about blowing up things by turning them into black holes I mean, I guess, I guess one way you could look at this, it's the difference between old school shonen and modern shonen. Uh, in a way, uh, bear with me. This maybe is a bit far reaching, but when I was comparing older shows to newer shows, in like something like Dragon Ball, we still have the power of friendship, but we always had constant training montages and people um, like desperately trying to to work out new techniques and stuff. And while that like, still exists quite a lot in modern shonen. There, there has been more of an emphasis on just the power of friendship in a way that we don't really need to see the training and all the hard work implied because when we have such a character, generally it's assumed that they're doing it in the background, like you said. I guess we... we no, that's... that's there is a point here I want to make. I just don't know what I mean, exactly I'm trying I, to say. So I see where you're trying to go, but I, th- I think this is actually a problem of more modern shown in that I think it's shallower. And the, if you're trying to say that you're that it's not about the abilities you're born with, it's about how hard you work, then you should focus on how hard people are working and not on their abilities. Yeah, but but what I'm saying is really not true when I now think about it. Like a lot of modern children actually do have these things. Like My Hero Academia is all about working for the things you get. So th- I'm just going to cut that entire point because I, I had a point there, but it needed more writing out to actually be valid guess Ian you've won this argument because neither me or Freya <laughs> Fred, get reply no, no, to no, this no, no 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 the problem is now I've forgotten what he said because he went on a tangent about Snowden and now my brain's broken yeah I think this anime pays lip service to the idea of hard work being useful to overcome things when really it's about the cool robot like we all agreed in episode one of Gunbuster that the Inazuma kick uh, from Noriko was ridiculous, uh, <laughs> but it made sense in the context in the way that, like, but but in the when we get the Inazuma kick from Nono in episode one of this, we're not thinking, man, she's worked hard to get where she is. We're thinking, what the fuck's up with Nono? I guess there's some su- something suspicious going on with her, and that's fine in episode one. It makes sense, but. Uh, like so, I'm not. I'm not saying that one episode is better than the other in that regard. But like, even when she when like she spends all this time trying to get a Buster machine so that she can prove that she can be a pilot, and then when she's about to get one, she's just like, "Oh wait, Lalk is in trouble. Teleport. I'm a Buster machine." But one thing that is quite nice about Nono is just how comic she is. Um, like it's really her like her character animation fantastic at this mm-hmm. um uh, i would mostly i, I mean I'm, I'm i'm only gonna say this now because i've been thinking about it but like shout out to ayumi shiraishi because 
<laughs> like just like when she gets all excited and she like becomes like deformed and her eyes get big. I mean, m- one of my main favorite things about doing research for the show was reading about this one guy's theory that no, no is actually Jung Freud who had cyborg <laughs> had become a cyborg in order to wait for Noriko and Kazumi's return. Okay. It's complete nonsense, but it was just a random comment on a site. And I just very much enjoyed that idea. If that um, were true, that would be amazing, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but it's not true. Unless that's what we learn in, in, <laughs> Dive, in Gunbuster 3. It's all about you and Freud. Dive stop, dive stop. So first, okay, I have to admit, I was confused when we when we first get introduced to Lal, because they keep referring to her as Lal Kimi. And I'm like, is she actually a princess? When was a monarchy re-established? But that shouldn't have surprised me, because now there is an imperial Japanese government on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it seems to just be a nickname, I guess, because she's like, she's kind of standoffish. Um, she also has the nickname the Curve Breaker, which I assume it just uh, means she's breaking all the the projections and killing so many space monsters. Is off that's, the what, that's what I think too. But it's never really explained. I actually quite like uh, like Lark. I think she's a much more fun character to follow than Kazumi ever was. She she is the Kazumi here in that she's the cool and confident. And she's the best at being a pilot. But she's also a lot more dismissive of Nono than I feel mm-hmm. that Kazumi even was of Noriko. Like, Kazumi never thought that Noriko lived up to her standards um, until, like, later on in that show. Whereas Lalk, I guess, by differently, I don't think she even, like, recognizes Nono as being, like, capable of doing anything uh, and, like, contributing to the fight until... Until she does. <laughs> I think that's one of my big problems with this show and the expanded focus on other characters. I really think that instead of spending all of episode three on Tycho, it really should have been focused on developing Lalx and Nona's relationship more because it kind of gets done retroactively after where we have the forced breakup moment in episode four where Nona overhears Lalx kind of shit talking about her. And episode six is where we learn about all the like cool stuff they did as friends, <laughs> like, yeah, learn, yeah, like, like yeah. about birds and stuff. And it's just like, show don't tell, bro. <laughs> yeah, like all of that should have been happening during the show and not as flashbacks during episode six. Look, 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 look. Also, the flashback is showing you. And B, show don't tell is a CIA uh, psyop. Um, that is literally true. <laughs> Ish. You should look it up. Okay, I will. Well, what, what I mean when I, when I was saying, like, show don't tell, is that I often feel this way about flashbacks, like, after it's already had. It's like, here is why their relationship was so close, whereas we didn't get to see the development of their relationship quite to that extent. Nono always seems to be just obsessed with Lalk. I think the thing is, is that they are trying to show Lalk as being uh, very aloof. and. I don't think her character arc would work quite as well if you put that stuff earlier in the show. Having said that, I probably would have ditched the second half of episode two in favor of it. At least to me, her whole arc is just like, this is kind of reaching out a little bit further to what we're going to talk about later, but it's all about the topless are essentially all teenagers, and you can only be a a topless while you're a teenager. Once you reach a certain age, you'll automatically lose your powers. And grow up, and that's very reminiscent of, of course, Magical Girls, where it's a kind of youthful magic that is only available to children or young people, and once you become a, air quotes, adult, you naturally lose that magic and transition into a new stage of life. Except now it's a literal part of the universe instead of just implied. Mm -hmm. Yes, in Die Buster, the topless, they're all young people, they're afraid of growing up, they're afraid of losing what makes them special. And that's really Lark's whole deal. She is the super special one. She's the curve breaker. She's a princess. Everybody expects her to be the top, topless, so to speak. And she's really closed off. She's, she's, it's a character arc we've seen plenty of times before. The isolated, talented one who needs the cheerful, slightly dumb one to thaw them out and allow them to make meaningful human connections which we see later in episode six when she goes to take a picture with all the other topless, uh, which is not something she would have ever done before. And the flashbacks are just there to really show that thawing out process a little bit more. But 
you, Freya, you mentioned that the uh, her arc wouldn't have worked that well, but I st- still think that if we'd interspersed these scenes of them going closer through the episodes, then that would have made the breakup much more meaningful than the, the loss also more impactful. The problem with this idea of associating the growing up theme with her is that it's already being done through Nicola. He is at the cusp of losing his powers and, do- and knows it's going to happen and doesn't want it to happen. Or the twin who have somehow artificially extended their power, their their long lifetime through eating unspecified things. I mean, they're eating the eating the original aliens from Gunbuster. That's what I thought, but well, it wasn't entirely clear to me last time I watched it. Why is that a problem? Well, it's just that the time that they were that you're saying that that could be spent on like her, like worrying about losing what makes her special, is that is being taken up by the time that Nicola is spent worrying about the stuff that makes him special. And the borderline rape scene aside, they could have just removed Nicola and did that stuff with Lauk. I, I disagree. I think they're both going through the same arc, but they're showing different examples. Yeah. Lal, Nicola is maybe what Lauk could have been. Not the sexual assault, I mean, but the really despair and violently acting out against other people if she didn't have no-no. Nicola is the extreme example of what could happen to a topless. Cassio as well, he is the only adult on the topless team. He's their tech support, and he is also a former topless. And he's he's kind of the 31-year-old year who's still desperate to try and reconnect with his youthful side, with um, trying to re- recreate the magic. He's Ian. <laughs> no, sorry. sorry. <laughs> he, he, he's, just, he's just sort of given up. Yes. And is yes. just desperate to remain part of it while still hoping that he will eventually one day, like, get to do it again. The only uh, topless doesn't actually go through this arc as Tico, to the same extent, rather. Like, I mean, I don't think Tico spends as much time worrying about this as the rest of them. Presumably because she's still young, younger than them or so, but yeah. I think all of all, the three of them generally symbolize the three different angles of this narrative. One is... The better way to handle it is because she's had no no, she's thought out, she's she's not afraid of the transition anymore, so to speak. Nicola, who is acting out violently against it and rejecting it. And then we have Cassio, for whom it's already happened, but who is still clinging to it, even though he really shouldn't. But yeah, I, I actually think Lalk's arc works really nicely. Though honestly, I don't think her relationship with Nicola was all that necessary, but I assume it was mostly there because she was desperately seeking that connection which she now has with Nona, she was seeking close contact, yeah. which is why we get the scene in episode two where she's like, oh, I can hear your heartbeat, and she feels close to a person. And yet it still feels very distant, their relationship. Mm-hmm. I definitely think the impact that Nona has on Lalk is much greater than the impact that Kasumi has on Noriko. Yeah, Because Noriko really undergoes her own story. She grows up by the events that happen to her, the coach helps her a little bit. And she, of course, admires uh, Kazumi a whole bunch. But Kazumi doesn't actively contribute to Noriko's change during the first four episodes. Uh, whereas Nono really heavily impacts the way Lalk acts. We immediately see that in episode two, where originally Lalk was totally happy to just let the ship with Hattori on it drop onto Mars and let all the people on it die. But then Nono convinces her that it's that she should go and save the ship, so she does. The Kazumi uh, Noriko relationship always, to me, felt like it was more of a like co-worker type thing. Even yes. though I think the show was going for their friends at the end, but it still didn't really feel like that. Whereas here, uh, I mean, to be honest, they seem like a bit more than friends. Even if it's retroactively justified, uh, they feel a lot closer uh, than. Um, nor can Kazumi did. Yeah, like like Lalk and, and uh, Nono hang out outside of work. Kazumi has her own thing. She's like, "Well, I'll see. I'll see you tomorrow when we cl- when we clock in." Nori. <laughs> I'm gonna hang out. I'm gonna go hang out with the coach now. Lalk's arc is set up in episode three with another character's uh, arc, which all happens within one episode. I love Tico, or as her full name is, Tico Science. <laughs> We're keeping in the Jung Freud tradition of stupid names, although Tico Science is infinitely less stupid than Jung Freud. 
Oh, uh, it's 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 like the thing is until like until like I looked up like, do the research for this. I don't. Her last name is never mentioned. I think <laughs> no, no. But like it just puts it over the edge when you learn that it's science. So she definitely fits somewhat in the Jung Freud role, but she's a much better Jung Freud than Jung Freud ever was. Because Jung Freud comes in and she's the frenemy antagonist. It's just like, oh, you're Kazumi. You're the best hotshot pilot. Want to fight? And then afterwards, it's like, no, now we're best friends. Retroactively, Jung Freud is like re- way worse than I think we said in that episode <laughs> as a character. <laughs> Yeah, whereas like Tico, she definitely starts off as like she's impulsive. She's just she's competitive. She her competitiveness gets her so far that she ends up destroying her machine, like just to try and get that one more kill. But once this happens and she's like taken off and she's like demoted, like no, no levels of duty. Like, yeah, you can you can pilot one of like the spare machines and use that to set up the minefield. But you, you don't get a buster machine yet. Like she she starts to chill a bit, like she, like she essentially has to retarget herself. Like she can't compete against Lalk until she gets back in a buster machine. So she has to compete against Nick to prove that she's the next one into the in to get who should get the next machine. So her competitiveness sort of just transfers. And we do get at least some idea of what motivates her. I don't think we have any idea about what motivated Jung Freud other than like to be the best, like no one ever was. I'm the Soviet one. I'm the uh, representation of the other. I'm here to be conquered and then sit around naked. Whereas for Tycho, it's really all about uh, the relationship with her dead brother, who, as we said, died of space radiation disease. <laughs> the, one of the main plots of episode three, as we said, is they're, they're taking a medical exam for space radiation disease. I'm really confused why Nono is there, because she's a robot. So why, how could she get the, that disease? Yeah, but like, what did they remove from her? Because like they were removing, because they were removing blood from Tico, right? Robot blood. Uh, Tico's earrings get stolen. They were made by her dead brother, so they act like as an important emotional keepsake. So they go on this whole chase to get them back, and that's where they find the orphans. And that's when Tico's all like, "Ah, oh, I don't fight for these. Or- I'm not going to help these orphans. Fuck them. <laughs> uh, they can they can die and starve here. I don't care." And then we get the whole no no talking sense into her. I mean, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's not that much of an exaggeration. <laughs> I do have to say, I do love the mech uh, she gets, because it's it's a giant aim for the ace reference. It's a tennis player with a yeah. racket, and her attack is like, <laughs> uh, her attack is a giant smash. The, but, no, but the best thing about that robot is mint condition, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that was just a great touch. That, that really made me wonder how they made these gunbusters. But Tico, like, she eventually like comes to accept the fact that like, she wasn't responsible for her brother's death. Yeah, and then there's a weird moment where her topless powers somehow allow her to basically transcend time, and she hovers outside the window of her dead brother's room, and it's implied that he can see her. Uh, it's just, art- I, I just call it artistic light. I don't think there's... I, I think that's... Because part of her whole arc is letting go of the past and then accepting it. So... Having her do her big heroic moment and then have an internal like, oh, I'm floating through space so I can see the past. My brother looks at me uh, through the window and I can't see his eyes, but he's smiling. Is like a good, oh, I'm, I can accept this now. And then it's even represented out of the universe after she, having thrown away her earrings uh, to get in the mech, letting go of the past. Nono then takes them, uh, puts the earrings and, uh, yeah, no, puts her ear ornaments into a snowman as a smiley face. That was a really good uh, bit of visual storytelling. I guess that's actually that's actually a much better interpretation. The reason why I wouldn't be disinclined to believe it is because we'll talk about this also more in a second. The topless are literally able to alter reality, so it wouldn't be that well, surprising. I didn't I didn't even read it as something that was literally happening in the universe. I just thought it was something that was happening within her own head. Yeah, yeah. That's, I, 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 this is my take. Is mm. the it's it's internal. I mean, it's a much better take than mine. I, I guess it goes to what you were saying about Nona earlier, but I did like how she gets the robot rather than Nona. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, I like the episode to like work really well. Also, I feel like that that act of like generosity, I guess, on Nona is kind of why she thaws so much to her afterwards. Like, you just see her just sort of hanging around with Nona while she's cleaning in episode. Four. 
Like yeah. she's she's got like no animosity towards her anymore. It's just like, yeah, you're cool. Mm. I also I I part of the reason I liked the um no no quote unquote inspires her is because they do this thing where they like cut between that conversation and a conversation that Jung was having with Lauk earlier where she's like yelling about her um, past when they like intercut that with scenes of Nona like crossing her arms and looking uh, really unimpressed, which is a really good way of putting you in Jung's, um, uh, no, not Jung, she's not there, <laughs> Tycho's headspace while being economical with your storytelling and how she's stuck in this, she's stuck in the same uh, loop over and over. Episode three is good. Episode three is good, but I do wonder whether it could have, would have better served with focusing more on the relationship. Because after that, Tycho, Tycho is really a character in episode three. And then, as you said, she's just kind of there in the background. Would that episode have been better served focusing more on, like, entirely dedicated to Lark and Nono? Like, if we had an episode where the two of them were stuck somewhere together uh, or something like that. I wonder whether that might have been more effective for the overall plot of the anime. No, because Tycho's little mini arc there is important to set up the um, maturing themes with mm. the topless going on later. What I would do is intercut it into episode two. You know, we're saying all this, but I actually liked the flashback, how the flashbacks were done visually. I mean, visually, I, I have no complaints of this show. Flashbacks are not a bad, are not an automatically bad thing, despite what some people think. <laughs> And just to be clear, Freya is not throwing shade at me. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> because Ian liked some flashbacks, I'm sure. When we, when we talk about bad flashbacks, I think the anime we always think about is Terraformers, <laughs> where each episode was about half flashback, half fight scene. <laughs> sometimes, like, the flashback was to a fight scene as well. Or oh, sometimes uh, you have a whole two part arc where the first uh, uh, episode is 75% flashback. But yeah. Tico Science, best girl. We've already talked plenty about the topless, but one of the things we haven't really mentioned yet is their ability to really alter reality. Their, their super moves are essentially called reality cancelers and exotic maneuvers. <laughs> I can't take the exotic maneuver stuff seriously. They also basically have like a little pin on their head that they, or like a little posted on the head that they pull off to summon their mechs. I, I remember being very confused by the first episode because in order to determine like whether or not Nono was a, uh, was a new type, she attached this little sticker to her head, which broke immediately. But like these stickers, or whatever they are, seem to be things that are used to contain the new type abilities. Like, so, so why was that the thing to do it? Because like, surely her if you, how can you tell they're a, they're a, they're a new type by putting in the thing that prevents them from exhibiting the ability? I didn't get that. I don't care. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, one of the things that I like quite liked was like how Captain Hattery was right, <laughs> just yes. about about how the the top uh, the uh, the new types and the aliens are essentially the same thing. I, I, well, basically, what is happening with the aliens is that they're not aliens; they were in the sense of the space monsters from Gunbuster. They are the planetary defense system they created to fight against the aliens, but then it started it, then it started thinking that the the humans, and in particular the new types, were the aliens and started attacking the, the them. I think that's it. Either that or they were sealing in the humans in the red Milky Way. One of the things I've, I found more curious is their ability to basically summon the buster machines like stands from their shadows any way they want to. I mean, one of the things about Die Buster is that it's much more super robot than Gunbuster, which was still quite super robot at times, but it had the physical limitations. Yeah. Of Gun Gunbuster paid some lip service to the idea that physics is a thing. Die Whereas, Buster was under no such illusion. <laughs> The, the topless are basically determinators, able to change reality at will, denying denying the fact that they're slowly turning into adult, which works quite well with the theme of the show. It's the power of belief and imagination that allows them to do their special moves. Like in episode five, Lark uses these nerve and an exotic maneuver to literally grab a planet that's way beyond the size of the mech, but through she the sheer power of belief, she's able to conjure up ethereal hands that throw the planets in in the in the mech stead 
the genre question is interesting because uh, here we have a in-universe time gap representing a like out of universe twenty years moving by in the anime industry and how they treat men. So now we've gone from mostly proportioned-ish robots that move and have weight to them to I have a giant cape and uh, which is awesome, by the way. And I have a tennis racket. Uh, you know, we've gone from, like I said, real robot to super robot, and then we've gone even more super robot since then, I think. I'm saying it would surprise no one to learn that I much prefer real robot style to super yes, robot. Yes, I'm not surprised at all. What a surprise. I don't like either of them. <laughs> I love both of them. Uh, but yeah, like, Die Buster in its essence is, it's both a celebration of Gumbuster and... Uh, Going next as a whole, it's 20th anniversary. I'm shaking my head so much at you right now. But at the same time, uh, it's completely the opposite story. Where Gumbuster was all about growing up, Noriko is growing up, Diebuster is all about refusing to grow up, and the consequences that act brings with it. That still makes it a story about growing up. I want to say that there is like the one similarity in that the people who live inside of the military lifestyle Gunbuster also don't seem to be able to function outside of, it. but like this has handled in a in a very different way. Uh, and of course, like although we've kind of implied it so far, Gunbuster was very much about space travel and like expanding the limits of humanity. I guess. Um, whereas this has got us can reconfined to our solar system essentially for defensive reasons. Despite the fact that I thought that we destroyed all the aliens in the end of Gunbuster. But nope, they're still here. They're... We did. We need to break another limit. And the entire plot of the final trips is essentially the final big super alien that they defeated at the end of uh, Gunbuster with its black hole. It's been slowly clawing its way out of the black didn't hole. Exist. Yes, the one that didn't exist. Diebuster! So, we, you wonder how we're going to shoehorn imperialism in this time. Uh, well... I'm, talk, I'm, talk, I'm talking about us here, not the show. Two words. Lunar Tokyo. Yes. So, we go five episodes. All right, we've got no um, fucked up Okinawa in the background. We've got no allusions to um, conquering other countries. No allusions about Japan being for above everyone else. And then in episode six, oh, the Earth government um, is a bunch of old people who live in a uh, traditional Japanese house on the moon, which is not at all like Princess Kaguya. <laughs> and they're all wearing old Navy uniforms. On the plus side, at least they let women in. <laughs> yes. This would be kind of an interesting commentary on the how, on people's nostalgia for, um, yeah, well, old Imperial um, Japan, I guess. Because we've got on so long that we've forgotten all the bad parts. If it weren't for the fact that Gunbuster uh, thinks those things are good. So here, it's just kind of a thing that's in the show. Yeah, it's not as bad. And it doesn't ruin the... Th- it doesn't, like, make the theme... Some of the themes wonky, like it did in Gunbuster for me. Who cares? Let's move on. I guess we could do a reading of Die Buster uh, with the idea of clinging on to, the pa- uh, to past glories as a bad thing. We could apply that to the imperialism as they're the leftovers that some people are still clinging on to, even though the majority of people really don't care about it or want it. Well, yeah, no, it's, it's we're just these assholes, but that's, like I said, it's not really, like, it's just, they're not really trying to say anything with uh, this, uh, at least to me. But I do think your point about uh, Die Buster in some way being about people clinging on to old things is uh, something that we've already talked about a lot, but it's a, uh, it's good. I mean, what is a 20th anniversary special but clinging on to, but clinging and celebrating the old? And then moving on. And on that note. <laughs> so, yeah, this is the 20th anniversary project, which means it's essentially a fan service. Now, when I say that, I don't, of course, mean fan service in the sexualized, but the show is as a celebration of Gainax surviving for 20 years is just, hey, you like Gainax? Wait till we show you all the cool stuff we do at Gainax. We've mentioned, of course, like the relationship between Diebuster and Gunbuster, which you can't get away with. 
But the most apparent uh, fan service reference show, in to me at least, was fully. Episode one contains like at least a dozen scenes which are just ripped straight out. Like any time when Lalk is on the scooter, it's a fully coolie reference. The bit with the van in episode one, where when the uh, boss is chasing after it, that's a fully coolie scene. Of course, this really isn't a surprise when we consider that both shows share the same director, Kazuya uh, Tsurumaki. And the same uh, character design Designy? Mm-hmm. Designer. Character designer, um, Sadamoto, who you will know from Evangelion and for being a racist. Oh, both of those things are true. It was just apparent to me just how much of episode one in particular was just a fully coolie reference. Maybe if I had like watched more of Mahoromatic or... Uh, this ugly, like, beautiful world, I would point to all the places where it references that, which I assume it did. But it was just so much fully coolie. It wasn't yeah. even... But since we were mentioning fan service, we have to talk about the sexual aspects of fan service. I guess we don't actually have to talk about it, but we're going to talk about it. First of all, we have not one, but two chess ripping scenes, referencing, of course, Gunbuster Episode 6, in episodes both 1 and Episode 6. And... In both of those cases, is it entirely unnecessary and inappropriate? Like I argued, I argued in uh, in our Gunbuster episode that I felt that in episode six, it was actually kind of a thematically poignant moment where the nudity worked, and it didn't like it didn't feel fans of it to me. It felt like a really raw emotional moment where she was burying her heart, like ripping out her own heart, to save humanity. So I would say that there, the, I would say that the, the episode of six of Gunbuster had plausible deni- uh, artistic deniability. This is not true here. Whereas here, because they do it twice, it just feels like they were trying to reference Gunbuster rather than making trying to recreate the same impact. So, I mean, if you are arguing that it was cheap, then I would say that it is trying to recreate the set. Then you would say that it is trying to recreate the same impact, but doing it hollowly. Yes, anyway, yes, yes. if you're going to argue that it was an artistic choice in the original, you have to argue that it is here too, because they placed it at very specific points to set up Nono as the Nono uh, as the Noriko character, and then Lauk literally performing the same actions because she's reached the same point in her arc, and she is literally inheriting Noriko's role within the show. Okay, so let's talk. Let's talk. Let's consider them both separate. And I realize we're spending way too much time talking about chess ripping. Whatever. In, ep- in the first episode, there is no artistic justification for it whatsoever. What it is, is they thought it would be funny to call the people who have these powers topless. And then no is like, oh, I need to be topless to fight. Rip. Now I, will, now I can unazuma kick. Completely unnecessary. The second one, I would give it more credit if she didn't just change into the uniform literally the second before <laughs> she ripped her chest. Yes. That scene was dumb. I do find it hilarious that there's a button she can push that just makes all her clothes burst off. Yes. And then for some reason she needs to then bend over and pull her. Anyway. Um... Look, I, look, if you're going to create a, a naked but na- nakedity button, I would be okay with that for uh, go at night. But I don't need it in anime. Just for the record, fan service is unfortunately an artistic choice. Whenever you do it, it's usually a bad one. Personally, I don't like any of the chest ripping scenes, so I don't really care about this point. Um, in terms of how it's treated more generally in the show, it's weird comparing it to Gunbuster because a lot of the times it happens in Diebuster, it's happening in universe, which yes. makes it more like they're happening. Which feels to me like they were actually considering how to use it more than they were in Gunbuster, where, to be honest, a lot of the time it felt right. like. Just... So I, th- I think what you're referring to is episode two, where not only is Cassio and Nicholas spying on Nono, yeah. and debating the merits of Robot Moi versus Lolly Moi. Yes, because they've got to set up with those two characters. Well, Nicholas is a trash pile, anyway. <laughs> well, I mean, Cassio, like, despite the fact that he is, like, nice. And occasionally, it's all for a kind of a dick. is a fucking creep. Yes, and that's kind of again kind of the point. He feels like he's uh, his character is supposed to be 
um, a like meta thing about Otaku, which is, uh, I don't know, that stuff never feels quite uh, right. Anyway. So I will say this. In Gunbuster, it was much easier to ignore. I don't agree. Because, like, we can talk about, like, the, the jiggle or whatever, but, like, if I'm not paying attention to that, then I can just sort of pretend it doesn't exist. Whereas we had a whole scene where it was just robot sexual harassment of yes. Nono in episode one. Yeah, I do see the point in that. All of the fan service, like the majority of the fan service in Gumbuster was more us looking, as Freya has said, more of us looking at it yeah. non diegetically, whereas most of the fan service is in Die Buster is diegetically. It's the robot well, harassment in episode it. one. Not all of it. Of course, there's plenty of low low camera angles. The camera never felt as leery in Gumbuster as it did in Die Buster, even though it was still leery at times. It very often felt more. I want to say natural in a way. Well, it didn't. A lot of the time, it didn't specifically focus on the uh, thing. Yeah. Having said that, I don't think it quite worked. The sexual assault scene is there to set up um, Lauk's and Nono's relationship. I wish they had framed it slightly differently. Um, however, the the um, the lesbian roses behind uh, uh, Lauk when. Uh, thingy is staring at there is so much better than the stupid sparkles in Gunbuster, even though it's way more over the top. Anyway, that's a stupid point. Yeah. We've talked way too much about this. Mm-hmm. Both shows, in my opinion, don't handle it very well. Die Buster is at least slightly more interesting in how it handles it to me. Die Buster! Die Buster! So we, we've hinted at like various elements of the visuals throughout the uh, thing. We've sort of referred to some of the staff members already like Kazuya Tsurumaki and so. well, he's interesting because he's sort of gotten stuck as Anna's lackey after um, after Die Buster because except for Dragon Dentist all he's been doing is co-directing the Evangelion uh, rebuilds and of course he was an important figure in Evangelion 2 but that was felt way more of a like top down Anno pushing stuff on him whereas the um, rebuilds feel like more of a co-project uh, at least from what I could tell I could be way off base with that, and of course, Fooly Cooly, uh, which is better than this show, much better. <laughs> also shared with Fooly Cooly, apart from well, a lot of people is the series composer Yoji Enokido, who you will uh, remember from Shock Horror Star Driver, but also uh, Oran and Utena, and lots of other things. So you know. He's one of those ambitious writers who ends up all over the place in terms of how people uh, feel about their projects. The animation style in this show is very different from that of um, Gunbuster, but that's really just a natural progression of how animation has changed with the turnover at staff at Gainax. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The names that come up when you look at who is doing the animation and are the names you get you see becoming the people who form Studio Trigger, right? Like, we're talking we're talking Yo Yoshinari, Sushio, we're yeah. talking Imaishi, as opposed to, um, like, all, like, the classic mech people who I was fawning over <laughs> last time. It's more cartoony, it's more bright. I, I, I don't mean cartoony in a bad sense. Like, I alre- I've already, like, said very nice stuff um, about Ayumi Shiraishi and about just how squishy Noriko, uh, uh, Nono is. They did a very good job. I really don't have anything to complain about uh, visually in this anime. Personally, one of my main problems with the last one was that besides the Gunbuster itself, most of the mech designs weren't very interesting. They were all kind of the same mech with different coloring or decals on it. Whereas here, every single one of the Buster machines has a completely unique look to it. Like, these nerf, while he does look like Evil Emperor Zerg from Toy Story 2... <laughs> I've already tweet. I already tweeted about it. Yes, yes. He's got a really cool, like, school bancho design with like with his big purplish cape, uh, his red thrusters, horns, and the thing that goes through his eye. That's like a big crescent moon. Mm, yeah. I, I just think it's a really cool design. I honestly prefer it to his true transformed states, where he gets big. Google, where he get the he gets the even bigger googly anime eyes. Yeah, I'm not a fan of. Um, I forget what they call, but yeah, the final stage Disney. Mm-mm. Where he's just like red man. I do like that he's opened his cape up, showing that uh, Lalk has finally like made her fucking connection. I also do like that the cape is just 
like an actual part a weapon that's part of him that he can take off and throw around. Mm-hmm. Having said that, I don't really like mechs. I like the ones here even less than I did in mm-hmm. Gunbuster, where I was just kind of neutral on these ones are kind of obnoxious at times. On the other hand, the aliens, which I think we all really liked in uh, Gunbuster... Not in episode six, but yes. Yeah, here, the actual aliens that we fight through most of the show are really kind of generic monsters that don't really do it for me at all. So I'm much happier towards the end of the show when we go back to the Gunbuster aliens. So they do have the old one come back, and then they cut its head off and turn it into a an Evangelion angel, only way more boring, because they effectively turn it into a big polygon with an eye on the front, and I really wish they hadn't put the eye on, but that's okay. Uh, which means that the final confrontation is a bit not great. The uh, protection force monsters are also kind of... They're mostly pretty boring. The one in the first one feels like a Starship Troopers reference, which is weird. The Swarm one's kind of cool, I'll tell you what I did like, the the human spaceships. The ones that look like sperm. <laughs> well, less of those ones. The sort of ret- the retchery round with the um, like Enterprise um, arms coming off with the engines pointing back. Mm-hmm. They look kind of stupid, but they were nice. I don't entirely prefer the animation here to uh, the animation from Gunbuster, mostly because I'm a really big fan of the old-timey effects stuff. Yeah, and the detail that early Gainax took to its mechanical design, some of that has gone away here. But on the other hand, if we we all like what Trigger can do, and they have these very exaggerated, very anime ways of doing things that really celebrates limited animation and stylistic, um, almost sort of abstract ways of representing various things with it. It's the way they pause between frames. They're very jerky in a way. Got much longer impact frames at times. Yeah. And the one scene I want to point out is I think it's in episode three when Lalk and her are like both going to see the new ship, and then there's just like she, like Nona is just like behind um, Tico, and then she like just jumps up and she's like a Looney Tunes character like with moving her feet to like propel herself. It's uh, it's adorable. I love it. it. I think it just once again goes back to the super robot versus real robot divide in a way like Gunbuster most movement was much more realistic there was a certain weight to the characters where you see everything is very as you said cartoonish jumpy which also fits with the animation style and the more striking and vivid colors rather than the more muted tones of Gunbuster yeah there was no danger of an episode in black and white here (laughs) I think for me uh direction wise Let's do a quick ranking from best to worst. Episodes five and six of Gunbuster, um, then all of Die Buster, and then the first four episodes of Gunbuster. <laughs> Even though episode five of Gunbuster is kind of my least favorite in other ways, but that's beside the point. It's really well directed. Die Buster! Die Buster! We have back again Kohei Tanaka remixing some of the same pieces, but also adding a lot of new ones. Uh, Music, I think, was a definite improvement. Definitely. I mean, Mars was there, but there was less of it, and we're all also, grateful for that. And he added way more instruments to it, which made it like feel more impactful, which I'm a fan of minimalism, but Gunbuster wasn't really that, like, aired down. So he added a pretty sick bass guitar to the uh, main theme. That was cool. As for me, it's been four weeks at this point. I don't really remember the score all that well. I remember the Gunbuster March and, of course, the bits for Mars. But the the main thing I remember is the opening, Grooving Magic. Uh, Grooving Magic by Roundtable. Roundtable from dozens of other anime openings. I think. <laughs> uh, Chobit's uh, Let Me Be With You, probably the most famous. But also, like, Aria and uh, Welcome to the NHK. I really enjoyed it. Uh, this opening. It was once again uh, directed and animated by Masayuki. And once again, it was a clip show. <laughs> but a much better one. <laughs> well, no, not much better, a better one. The things that I liked about it most were like the stylized uh, opening and ending for that, where yeah. like we just have Nona walking and. Oh, nice. 
Yeah, I thought I personally felt that should be the entire opening, but much like Gunbuster, we have a whole bunch of just scenes taken straight from the show used in the opening. Yeah. Rather than relying on uh, on on those trippy visuals stand so the, the visuals itself are quite nice when we have them. The reason that I think it's better is because it spends significantly more time just focusing on character. So it's less like boom, boom, boom all over the place. It's like you really get an idea of Nono's character from the opening. And the song, well, the song feels more appropriate. Yes. Probably because it's targeted at a specific character and not 80s training music. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whereas the ending was less impressive, I think. I honestly don't remember the song, despite having watched it several times. It was fine. What even? What was uh, the song called, Ian? Uh, Hoshikuzu Ida. It was by Akko, A-C-K-O. Hmm. Not to be confused with Akko at General Insurance, who is the first thing that will come up when you do it. <laughs> but mostly from, from like a visual standpoint, all that you could say about it is, like, you know how they do that thing in some, in some anime, like Hayatina Go, they get like, other artists to do the, the mid-episode eye catches? Mm. It felt like they did that and made that. Yes. Honestly, to me, when I looked at it, it felt like art from the visual novel adaptation of Die Buster. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it felt like to me. There was no visual novel application. There was indeed no visual novel application. Good. And also no strip poker game, no strip quiz game for this That's one. That's also good. I don't need more strip quiz game. <laughs> I think we've said everything we need to say about the show, now we need to rate it. And in honour of all the Buster Machines being in French, we want you to rate it from un to... Kater, Sank. I like how we didn't actually ask me who actually speaks French, but we just let me do trois, it. Quatre, cinq. Yes, Sank. Yes, that's correct. Un, to Sank. <laughs> why, why were they actually in French? That's a, that's a question we never even wondered about. I guess it's just they thought it would sound cool. Because it's the classic foreign language. Sounds cool. At least they didn't go German, because everybody uses German. Um, yeah, but every, everybody else uses French. I, I enjoyed this show uh, a lot. Um, there were problems with it. Having this argument, like Freya made some very good points that actually made me uh, see differently on some of the aspects that I didn't like so much, like the whole Tycho bit and uh, the chest ripping bit. I actually really like your interpretation of um, of that representing Nono and then Lalk becoming uh, Noriko at the end. And Ian also made some good points in the opposite direction. But overall, I do think. I enjoyed Gunbuster just a little bit more. There was something about Die Buster, maybe because it had to serve as a 20th anniversary special, and it is so closely bound to uh, Gunbuster, that it couldn't stand on its own that well. I really liked the way they did the whole story about the topless being, uh, having to grow up and stuff. But I wonder if Guy Buster would have been stronger if it if it had been a purely spiritual successor with no direct connections to it. Overall, I think I'm going to give this a 3.5 for me. How about you, Ian? How do I give points in French? <laughs> oh, uh, point. Point. So it'd be like, un point cinq. Un point ça... <laughs> Fuck. Un point cinq à deux. <laughs> which is probably the wrong way of pronouncing one and a half to two. I didn't like the show. It made me like dislike Gunbuster watching this. And I've had to watch the show four times now. And I hated it more every time. I hated it more every time I watched it. Like for me, this is, this is just like, like I'm glad Gainax had fun, but I honestly, watching it made me feel like they didn't understand and reading The Art of Gainax made me think that the author of that book didn't understand Gunbuster either. Only you understood Guy Bu- uh, Gunbuster, and nobody else did. <laughs> yeah, right. No one else but me understands the deepness that is Gunbuster. <laughs> How about you, Freya? Well, I have a different understanding of Gunbuster for me, and That's because you didn't understand it correctly. Apparently not. So I'm going to break the mold and give it a higher score than Gunbuster. Because to me, even though it's a more messy show, 
Uh, the problems with it don't quite muck up the themes as much as my problems with Gunbuster did. I find its take on uh, its take on uh, growing up to be the more interesting angle than Gunbuster. I found, to be honest, Gunbuster had one character who worked. Um, Diebuster has multiple characters who work for me. I accept that Nono is very divisive. I think, as I intimated, I low key prefer Gunbuster visually, but I am waffling. I'm done. Four. Four. <laughs> Tetra. We've given our scores. Denny, Ian, I don't have any trivia. Um, what trivia exists? I have two pieces of trivia. In episode six, there's a whole bunch of buster machines we haven't previously seen. And those were all from a contest uh, with the two winners of that contest actually having their buster machines performing attacks. The second p- uh, piece of trivia I have is that there is one cowboy style buster machine, which was submitted by the art designer of Mega Man Legends. That's a piece of trivia. It's completely random. Nobody knows it and nobody's going to care about it. But there it is. That guy would also later be hired by Gainax to illustrate for the Gurren Lagan card game, which, of course, there's a Gurren Lagan card game. I think part of the thing is here is that I didn't actually re- uh, notice most of the references, so they didn't bother. So there you go. If you like Gainax, you'll hate you'll hate this show more than somebody who doesn't like Gainax. <laughs> um, so Ian, what are we watching next week? We will be our uh, continuing our Gainax series. We will be continuing it with the Wings of Honeyamis. We right. hope in two weeks' time. <laughs> and that it doesn't end up being a month. We are the Anime Research Group, a bi-weekly for the moment podcast coming out every other Thursday, more or less. Well, that sentence was a thing. If you'd like to tell us what you thought of the episode or suggest something for future episodes, you can follow us on Twitter at research underscore anime or drop us an email at researchanime at gmail.com. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>